Coming to you from deep inside the bowels of a great big empty. Get ready for another episode of The Home Defense Show with Skip Coriel. Hello, American families. Welcome to this week's episode of The Home Defense Show. I'm your host, Skip Coriel. And if you love your family, care about them deeply, and want to learn how to protect them in every facet of your life, then you've come to the right place. we got a great show for you today, and I know that you're going to love it. Well, folks, the Second Amendment March of 2018 has come, and it has gone. And boy, did we have a wonderful time. We had a record crowd. We had people... You know, eating hot dogs, a Second Amendment sausage, freedom dogs. Oh, man, we had Madison Rising, the most patriotic band in America. And we had over a thousand people out there with guns, 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 and more guns. We had a great time. But I brought my son, my 12-year-old son, who accompanied me and helped me out at my booth to give a 12-year-old perspective on the Second Amendment March. This is my son, Cedar Lance Coriel. He's 12 years old. Cedar, welcome to the Home Defense Show. Thank you. Well, Cedar, what do you think? Give me your analysis on the Second Amendment March. Uh, what, What stuck out for you? All the guns. It was very, very safe, and I liked that feeling. We need more guns. (laughs) <laughs> okay, well, yeah, you know, nobody has enough guns, right? You, if you've got 25 guns, you know, one more is good. If you've got 26, one more is good. You just keep getting more and more guns. So um, any of any of the uh, firearms that you particularly liked this year? I liked one of the AR-15s. It was painted with an American flag. It was very, very beautiful. You know, I saw one, a lady had an AR-15 with this special camo job, and, uh, you know, instead of the regular kind of a pink uh, camo job that that, uh, ladies like to have, she had kind of like a harvest orange uh, camouflage, which was really, really nice, and because orange is my favorite color, but that was really, really nice. So did you enjoy the, how many, tell me. How many hot dogs did you eat yesterday? Two. You only had two? Yep. Oh, I think I had four. (laughs) Oh, boy, but there's nothing like an ice-cold Mountain Dew and a Freedom Dog at the Second Amendment March at the Lansing State Capitol. Well, Cedar, I want to thank you for coming to the Second Amendment March Uh, for helping me out at the booth, you know, selling my books and talking to all the people. Now, you liked a particular vendor that was right behind us. They were selling something that you really uh, were interested in. Tell us about that vendor. They were selling giant knives. (laughs) Giant knives. And uh, now you purchased one of those knives, did you not? Yeah, it was a large Winchester knife. A Winchester knife. It kind of looked like that that one that, that Rambo had. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, Cedar, I was happy to have you at the march. I, I love it when kids are there. Uh, we had a lot more kids this year, and we had a, a lot of women there, too, and it was it was really, really good. Cedar, it's time for you to feed the chickens and collect the eggs. Aww. Sorry, son. Say say goodbye to the listeners. Bye, American families. Have fun. <laughs> okay. Thank you, son. Bye. Okay, folks. That was my son, my 12-year-old son, Cedar Lance Coriel. We had a great time. It was so nice to, to share that with him because, you know, I don't like going there by myself. I, I mean, I, I love the people and everything, But when I can share things like that with my family that are important to me, I mean, this kid's homeschooled, so it's kind of like school for him because he learns about civics, he learns about freedom, he learns about all of his civil rights, his human rights. The thing about it is we had over a thousand people there in a tight enclosed area at the state capitol. Not a mishap, no negligent discharges, no violence. 
it was the safest place in Michigan at that time. And that's very telling. Uh, what, what does that say to us? That says, you know, it's not the guns. It's not that the guns exist. It's the person behind the gun. And when you have good people carrying guns, you're not going to have violence. You're, you're going to have very little violence. And so, boy, that was just fantastic uh, for me. Another successful march behind us, and we're already planning on 2019. Okay, well, hey, we've got a lot to cover today. We're going to have Joel Fulton. He was the MC at the Second Amendment March. He did an awesome job, and we're going to do our post-game analysis uh, in segments two and three. Um, but before we get to that, there's something that struck me in the news here. It was a really nice article, which just says everything I've been saying all along. The only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. So I'm going to BearingArms.com in the news. Armed citizen puts down bad guy in Washington state. Anti-gunners love to pretend that law-abiding gun owners are a threat to humanity. They dismiss any claims of self-defense as cowboy daydreams or wannabe Ramboism. It's not something they see as a real thing. Meanwhile, a law-abiding gun owner put down a shooter at a Walmart in Washington state. An armed civilian took down a shooter after at least two people were shot Sunday night at a Washington State Walmart, police said. Tumwater police said the civilian, described by officers as a good Samaritan, shot and killed a suspect at the scene. On Monday night, KIRO 7 confirmed the civilian is a pastor and works with the Oakville Fire Department where he is a lieutenant and an emergency medical technician. Now that does not surprise me at all. I think I'm working with six different churches right now as a consultant, helping them set up their safety teams and train them uh, for armed security. So it does not surprise me at all. The, the churches of America are waking up to uh, mass shooting events in America. The shooting happened just after 5.30 p.m. at the Walmart Supercenter in Tumwater. Tumwater. Yes, Virginia, there is a Tumwater about 65 miles south of Seattle. I heard two bangs. It sounded like gunshots to me, witness Robert Berwick said. I looked down the aisle and saw a person running. That's when Berwick ran too. There was chaos in the parking lot and he said the shooting suspect tried to carjack another man. That's when the suspect was shot. In other words, the good guy put the bad guy down. But if he hadn't, it appears there were plenty of others willing to step in. Another witness to the shooting, Megan Chadwick said her husband saw the civilian take down the shooter. He said he watched him, the shooter, take his last breath. Chadwick said there were three civilians going after him, the shooter to shoot him, and two of them had their guns up, and then the third guy shot him through the window of the car. So tell me again how an armed citizenry is a bad thing? It should be noted that Chadwick said her husband was armed as well. As a result, there were at least four armed citizens who were on hand to protect human life from someone who held no regard for it. Talk about a bad guy having a bad day. <laughs> you know, really, talk about picking the wrong place <laughs> to do a carjacking. <laughs> oh, set upon by four armed good guys with guns. And that's how you do that, folks, in Tumwater, Washington. I'm going to have to visit Tumwater. Sounds like a good place to me. All right. Here's another article that I wanted to share with you, uh, more as a, a word of warning, a caution than anything else. From BearingArms.com, hundreds of guns stolen out of Nashville cars. Last week, I wrote about how guns were being stolen out of the cars of Tennessee Highway Patrol. However, it seems that the THP aren't the only ones having this issue. Nashville police claim that 230 guns have been stolen out of cars throughout the city this year alone. Many of those cars were reportedly unlocked, making it simple for the criminals to gain access. Folks, I'd like to believe that the average Bearing Arms reader is smarter than that. I'd like to, but I can't just assume that, so let me lay out some quick thoughts. First, don't be an idiot. Lock your car doors. Seriously. I shouldn't feel the need to tell grown people to lock their doors, especially when property crime is still so rampant all over this nation. 
While locking your doors won't be a guarantee that no one will enter your vehicle illegally, it will help. Those who are just testing car doors will look elsewhere. Second, don't leave your gun in the car if at all possible. Having your gun on your person means it's not in your car for someone to steal. This isn't rocket science, folks. Absolutely. You know what? That's one of the reasons that I hate the so many pistol-free zones in Michigan is because you pull up to these places, you've got to take your gun off, you've got to put it in a gun safe or wherever you secure it and leave that gun unattended, unguarded uh, for one hour, two hours, three, four, five hours, maybe even overnight, depending on where you are. I highly recommend all of you get a mobile gun safe, a good one, not not the El Cheapo version from the dollar store, but get a really good one that you can maybe bolt to the floor of your car or cable to your seat, just something that makes it difficult for the bad guy to get the gun. Because once he gets your gun, boy, it was a tool that would stop the bad guy. Once he steals it, it's a tool that will help the bad guy hurt good guys. So, Lock your guns up inside your car and lock your car. Um, Don't help the bad guys out. All right. Well, folks, we have so much more that we have to do today, and we're out of time in the first segment. When we come back, we're going to be speaking with Joel Fulton from Freedom Firearms in Battle Creek, Michigan. And Joel was the MC to our Second Amendment March for 2018. Joel is going to be doing the post-March analysis with me. And, boy, you get ready because you know how excited Joel gets. The guy has a great perspective on the march because he heard all of the speakers. He was up there on the stage the entire time. So Joel is going to help us analyze the 2018 march and make it even better for 2019. All right, you got two minutes while you're away. Go ahead and check out our sponsors, EliteFirearms.us. And then also firearmslegal.com slash Midwest Tactical. When we come back, we'll be with Joel Fulton from Freedom Firearms in Battle Creek, Michigan. This is Skip Coriel on Home Defense Show. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. My name is C.J. Coriel. Welcome to the Home Defense Show with my dad, Skip Coriel. Don't go nowhere. We'll be right back. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want you to have the very best handgun that money can buy. And that's why we recommend you visit Larry Jackson at Elite Firearms and Training. As a concealed carry instructor, I see people every week out on the range with guns they can't shoot properly because they didn't know what to buy. That will never happen at Elite Firearms and Training. Larry Jackson will personally fit you with your very own personal defense pistol. So call Larry Jackson today. At 616-299-8715 or visit EliteFirearms.us. This is Colonel Danny Gillum. I host Front Lines of Freedom, a weekly syndicated military talk radio show. One of my co-hosts is Skip Coriel, the host of this show. We cover things that impact military and veteran communities, and we do it from the veteran's perspective. The show is broadcast across the nation and is also available as a podcast on our website, frontlinesoffreedom.com Please join Skip and me weekly on Frontlines of Freedom. Okay folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. This is your host Skip Coriel. We are speaking now with Joel Fulton from Freedom Firearms in Battle Creek, Michigan. Joel, welcome to the Home Defense Show. Hey, it's good to be here, Skip. Always great to be on the show. Great to be back with you. All right, Joel, you know, we, we're having you on today. I mean, aside from you being, you know, Mr. Incredible of the firearms world, firearms trainer par excellence, <laughs> you also uh, are the, the MC for the Second Amendment March, and that was just yesterday. So we're going to talk, uh, we're going to give like a post-game analysis of the Second Amendment March this year. Joel, in general... How do you think it went yesterday? Oh, I think yesterday was probably one of the best ones, that, and I think you'd agree with me, one of the best marches that we've had in years. Uh, and, you know, to a degree, maybe a little surprising because um, 
you have a president that's Republican, you have a legislator, leg, legislature that's Republican at the national level, as well as the entire state is pretty much Republican controlled. And you wouldn't think that there'd be a huge threat to firearms rights and that that would cause a lot of folks to come out. But honestly, it's really not so much the legislative side of it, although there's some talk about that, as much as it seems to be the war for ideals right now and the ideas that are being floated out there on social media and the utilization of uneducated children, I think is probably the best way to put it in trying to push gun control and using our kids against us, frankly. Um, And it's really disturbing to see that a lot of this is being organized at the educational level. And it's the same kind of thing we've seen throughout history where folks in tyrannical positions have used the kids to get the parents to do what they want them to do. Mm-hmm. Because if you do it in the name of the children, everybody's going to allow for the children. <laughs> and that line seems to work over and over again. And I think we're pushing back a little bit. Um, one of the speakers that we had yesterday was a young man named Dylan, and he has really pushed back on that. He gave a pretty decent speech yesterday and, quite frankly, has looked at things, understood the history, and exercises a bit of critical thinking, which I think is seriously lacking in our educational system and teaching our kids how to critically think about issues and have their own thoughts instead of what people tell them to think. Well, now, Joel... One of the disadvantages of being the founder of the Second Amendment March is I never, ever get to hear the speakers, you know, primarily because people are always talking to me or I'm doing interviews or whatever. Uh, Even at the National March, you know, back at Washington, D.C., I didn't get to hear any of these speakers. So this I I knew we had Dylan booked and I knew a little bit about him. But talk to me about Dylan. What what, uh, is his background? How old is he? and, And what did he say? Well, he's, I think he's 18 or 19 now, and he actually kind of went on YouTube and, and did a video and pushed back against the March for Our Lives. It kind of went viral, and he has stood firmly against that and has done quite a few follow-ups to that. And essentially was saying, look, it just doesn't make sense. It's the same things that we have said. I mean, we understand it. It's the same line of logic that we use and go, hey, look, you can disarm everybody you want to, but in the end, only the good guys are going to follow those laws. Bad guys are going to break those laws. Sometimes it's about the packaging. I remember that there was a YouTube video here not too long ago that ended up on, well, it wasn't a YouTube video. It was a uh, commission meeting down in the Carolinas. And a black gentleman was there and said some of the same stuff that you and I say over and over again. But somehow when it's packaged, because of the way that we look at political correctness and all those sort of things, suddenly it's mind-blowing to people that somebody in this package, somebody who wears this kind of skin or should be this particular individual, they should be Democrat, they should be whatever, that people want to put them into a box in, and they have a thought outside that box. People go, oh, I can't believe he said that. Mm -hmm. Well, no kidding, because we're all free people, and we all love our freedom. We get it. And when people start to critically think about it, they go, hey, look, you know what? If I don't have firearms, then, you know, eventually somebody in power is going to be able to make me do whatever they want to make me do, and I don't want to be in that position. I don't want to be somewhere where I can be subjugated. You're only saying that because that's what's always happened before. (laughs) It is what's always happened before. And probably one of the best speeches um, that went through that sort of a logical process was uh, Eric Utrecht of MDFI. Um, And his speech was spot on yesterday. It It was pretty powerful. Eric, now MDFI, what does that stand for? Michigan Defensive Firearms Instruction, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I know the initials are MDFI. Okay. Type that into Google, you'll find it. Yeah, I, I didn't get to but he does, talk to him. Yeah, he does a lot of training. In fact, uh, uh, Jared, my brother, is president of the Sportsman's Club of Battle Creek. I happen to be the secretary out there, mm-hmm. and he did a training class out there at our range last year, and that was good stuff. A lot of people went out there, and they really enjoyed it. Oh, good, good. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about we had the, the three candidates um, on the Republican side for governor, the three major ones, anyways. Um, what? Uh, yeah, there's what... four. There's actually four re- uh, candidates for Republican on the Republican side, and all four of them spoke yesterday. Okay, who, who was the fourth one? I had Shudi Colbeck and Kelly. Who was who was the fourth one? And Dr. Jim Hines. Jim Hines. Okay. Well, I know you 
are a big Bill Schuette fan. So why don't, why don't you start out with Bill Schuette? Uh, what did he say? Why should Second Amendment uh, advocates, uh, gun owners like us, vote for Bill Schuette for governor? Well, Bill Schuette has been a solid Second Amendment supporter from the time he stepped into the office, and even before that, um, he's always been a solid Second Amendment supporter. And I had the privilege of working with the Attorney General's office beginning under the Mike Cox administration. And when I met Bill Schuette, I uh, presented that to him and told him the kind of work I'd been doing, and he saw the wisdom in that, and he said, keep doing it. And I kept working with Bob Ayani, and then we've had a couple of folks in between their staff, folks that I've worked with. Um, but that's been a great relationship. Anytime I need something, I've been able to call and say, hey, Bill, you know, I need this. And what about an opinion on this? And a legislator sends over the question, and Bill starts shepherding it through. He's done some great stuff for us, quite frankly. Um, Mike Cox uh, reversed the Frank Kelly decision on our ability to own uh, – machine guns um, up to 1986 and previous to that we couldn't own some of the more modern stuff and Mike Cox reversed that and said nope that's not really what the law says his opinion was wrong and actually reversed an attorney general's opinion and they don't do that very often Mm -hmm. and then based on that same line of logic Bill Schuette said well look if you can own machine guns well these NFA items based on that same line of logic you can own stuff that makes them go quiet too which means we finally got silencers legalized in the state of Michigan where they weren't legalized before yeah and then since then have gotten it codified so he's really done some forward thinking stuff for us and as far as reciprocity we continued that process that was started in 2003 by the time we got to 2012 we had the most recognized CPL license anywhere in the nation no CPL license uh, you know, besides Michigan, is more recognized throughout the nation than Michigan's license. Yeah. Yeah. How many states can we carry in, though? 42. 42. All right. I thought we only had 40. Based on your Michigan, based on your Michigan license alone. Okay. All right. Well, hey, that's certainly important to me because I, you know, I've got relatives scattered all all across the country. So, all right. So, right. According to Joel Fulton. Basically, the East Coast and the West Coast is the only place you can't carry. <laughs> yes. And Illinois, you can travel through there. Just don't get out of your vehicle with it. Right. Right. Well, hey, Which it's is better than nutty, what it used but... to be, right? <laughs> okay. Well, you know, basically they're going, you don't get out of your vehicle. You can have it in your vehicle, but don't get out of your vehicle it means they don't want me to spend any money in their state. Yeah, and that's exactly. That's how I take it. Hey, I honor them. I drive right straight on through without stopping. Okay. All right. So, hey, Bill Schuette. So, according to Joel Fulton, Bill Schuette for uh, governor. Um, did you get to hear uh, Pat Colbeck's speech? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And Pat, to be honest, Pat Colbeck and Brian Kelly both um, have been with us at the march for several years in a row now. Um, they've been faithful supporters and they've shown up and they support the Second Amendment. And uh, Pat Colbeck always has voted the correct way on Second Amendment issues. Um, he's a conservative's conservative. I believe he is a great guy. I really like Pat a lot. Um, I just, based on organization and based on um, election and whether or not they can win, I believe Bill has a better chance of beating the Democrat candidate because of his organizational skills. Mm-hmm. And he's equally as good. So given that they're both equal, I'm going to roll with Bill. All and right. in full disclosure, I'm I'm Bill's campaign chair for Calhoun County. Okay, Brian so. Kelly, um, he's got a CPL license. Um, he carries concealed. I know he exercises his right. Um, and I gave, gave all three of them, four of them actually, very warm introductions. I, I tried to be as unbiased as possible, you know, functioning as MC. Brian, unfortunately, has been under the governorship of Governor Snyder, and frankly, Governor Snyder has been horrible for firearms. He, yeah. Yep. lukewarm at best. Jenny Granholm was better than he was on guns. And that's <laughs> sad to have to say. Yeah, it sure is. I was, re- boy, I was so mad at uh, Rick Snyder when he, you know, vetoed, uh, you know, getting rid of the pistol-free zones. Um, yeah, boy, we had just, it all the way through the legislature. Oh yeah, that just angered me so much. And in, in my opinion, okay, I'll give you give you my take on this. You know, I know Brian Kelly personally. I, I've known him since he, before he ran for uh, state rep. And I, I was, as the, the state director of Ted Nugent Sportsman, I was the first organization to endorse Brian Kelly when he wrote for, ran for state rep. And I, I was real happy with him. 
you know, but in my opinion, I don't, at least on the west side of the state and every place north and rural, I don't think having uh, Rick Snyder's endorsement is going to get him a lot of votes. Um, what do you think about that? I think it's a problem for him. I think he's tied to the administration. And on the and west is not going to give him a lot of votes, and east ain't going to give him a lot of votes either when you factor in the Flint water crisis. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. He's tied to that. He's gonna, He's got that tied to his neck like a millstone. Well, that is sad because I at least I I know that Brian used to be a great guy. Um, I haven't talked to him much. Well, you know, he still is a great guy. Let's not let's not say that Brian's not a great guy. He is an absolutely great guy. He's salt of the earth people. I think he's a wonderful gentleman, and I think he's passionate about some really great causes. When you talk about autism and some of the stuff he's done for that, he's done some great work, and and he continues to do great work. I'm just not convinced he can win. I think he gets hurt bad by some of those issues he's tied to with the current administration. Yeah. Yeah, I think that you're right. I think it might get him some votes on the east side um, as far as the Republican vote uh, in the primary. But there's not as many Republicans over on the east side as there are in the rest of the state. So, Correct. Uh, again, I just, uh, I'm not sure uh, that Rick Snyder is, is going to be helping him out uh, a whole lot. But, hey, I, I liked uh, Pat Kolbeck. I got to talk to him afterwards. Boy, I mean, just one-on-one with the guy. Um, did, you, did you see the, the book that genuine, he Genuine, personable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he wrote that book on draining the swamp, an outsider's, uh, you know, guide on draining the swamp. I haven't read that yet, but, you know, I, I got a copy of that, so I'm going to be checking that out. Um, what about, what about Colbeck's electability? Is that a problem? It is a problem. He doesn't have a lot of name recognition. And when we're going into a primary and, and people are going, who's Pat Colbeck? You know, he's a Tea Party favorite. He's got a lot of Tea Party folks behind him. But I'm just not sure that's going to be enough. And I, I, I don't even think he's going to make it through a primary with enough votes to get through a primary. Okay. All right. And if you can't get through a primary, you're, you're certainly, you know, you don't have the, the kind of juice that you need to get done to go up against, you know, the kind of money that's going to be thrown into the Democrat race for, for governor. And yeah. frankly, as, right now, I'm not sure Gretchen Whitmer has enough money to, to combat what is being put forward. And ideally, if I have Sri Thanadar as a candidate to run against for governor, mm-hmm. I'm going to be happy. Yeah. Based on principle and, and logic alone, I think we can beat that guy. Yeah, oh, that's good. All right. Well, hey, I don't know anything about Jim Hines, so go ahead, educate me on on Jim. Dr. Jim Hines is a complete outsider. He's never run for any office before, never held any political office, and um, he's a doctor. He has served not only as a doctor here in the States, but internationally. He's done a lot of great work um, in other countries. Um, He he brought and, and actually shared from his perspective why the Second Amendment is so important based on his experience internationally, where he has been in countries where they're not alone, allowed firearms ownership, and he's seen the devastation that happens to citizenry when the citizens are disarmed. Mm-hmm. So he said, look, the fact that we had to have armed guards while we were doing our work, he said, that's an issue. If, if you had an armed citizenry, we wouldn't have had to have that. Yeah. So his perspective was kind of fresh, and in sharing that from his life experience from being a doctor, um, I think he served with uh, Doctors Without Borders, um, oh. if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Don't quote me on that, but he's done that kind of work in other places. And he's just a gentle soul. He's a great guy. I think he's kind of a guy that you know speaks softly and carries a big stick, but he gets it. Um, and again, he just he doesn't have a name recognition, I don't think, to, to really get done what needs to get, be gotten done. Okay. All right, so those are the four Republican candidates. Uh, we didn't have any Democratic candidates, and not because they weren't invited. They just, you know, for whatever reason, thought their time was uh, better spent. Well, Joel, we're out of time. We for... did have a Libertarian candidate yes, for governor. John did. Cater was there. I didn't even know how to pronounce his name, so I, I, I didn't want to say it. Um, well, what, <laughs> well, real, real quickly, what do you know about uh, Mr. Tater? I don't know a lot about John Tater. I was just told, hey, he's not on your list, but can we get him a few minutes? And when Terry Stock says, hey, we want him speaking, I go, okay, and I put him in. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. And, uh, but, yeah, he had, a, he had a speech prepared specifically for that event, and he went through the history. He gets it. Um, libertarians are usually 
pretty solid when it comes to their understanding of the Constitution and how the history of that works and why it's supposed to work and how a republic is supposed to function, a representative republic. Yeah. And he was solid on everything he said. He's, he's right on the money. Well, okay, uh, we have went over a little bit in this segment, but that's good because everything that you're, you're teaching us today, uh, Joel, so I appreciate that. We're going to take a two-minute break here. When we come back, I want to talk about uh, next year's Second Amendment March because we are already planning for that. So, um, folks, go on out and check out uh, 2amarch.com for the wrap-up. That's number two, the letter A, march.com, 2amarch.com. And then also check out firearmslegal.com slash Midwest Tactical and elitefirearms.us uh, and support our sponsors. This is Skip Coriel on the Home Defense Show. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. on the Home Defense Show. Always use guns safely and wisely. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, folks. I want to tell you about my book, Civilian Combat, the Concealed Carry Book. More and more people across the country are seeing the dangers in society and are deciding to carry concealed to protect themselves and their families. My new book lays it out step by step. It'll teach you how to protect and defend the ones you love. Get the benefit of 17 years of teaching experience and a lifetime of training for this important role in society and in your family. You can get Civilian Combat real easy. Just go to Amazon.com, search on Skip Coriel Civilian Combat, and it'll pop right up there. Don't put it off any longer. Get Civilian Combat, the concealed carry book by yours truly, Skip Coriel. Wouldn't it be wonderful if life was like the movies and the good guys always won? In today's world, if you're forced to use your firearm to protect yourself, you will need protection. Firearms Legal Protection is here for you. FLP provides you with seasoned, experienced attorneys that handle your criminal and civil matters as a result of you protecting yourself. FirearmsLegal.com provides its members with uncapped attorney's fees, bail bond protection, and coverage in all 50 states. We are not a reimbursement plan. You can access uncapped attorney's fees for as low as $10 a month. Firearms Legal members are provided with educational services, training videos, and access to our vast national attorney network. While you're protecting yourself, let Firearms Legal protect you. Listen up, folks. This is important. There are plenty of legal protection services out there, but none will protect you as well as Firearms Legal Protection. This is the one I use and the only one I recommend. Visit firearmslegal.com slash Midwest Tactical and protect your family now. Okay, folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. This is your host, Skip Coriel. We are speaking again with Joel Fulton from Freedom Firearms in Battle Creek, Michigan. Uh, Joel, last segment, you educated us all about the candidates. Uh, You did a really good synopsis there, so we appreciate that voter's guide uh, that you gave us. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about next year's Second Amendment March, because, you know, we did a a bit of a, oh, uh, just an analysis uh, yesterday and early this morning uh, with the, the board members from Second Amendment March. Uh, I just want a shout out to Terry Stock, uh, Brian Jeffs, and uh, Nathan Nephew, because they do the lion's share of uh, organizing for Second Amendment March, uh, you know, for the SAM side. And then also I want to thank Michigan Open Carry and Michigan Gun Owners, uh, who did a, a great job uh, as well. Joel, who am I missing? Delta County Gun Owners Association. Tell tell me about Delta County Gun Owners, because um, I didn't get to talk to them, but they seem like a really solid group. Those guys are amazing. They started five years ago. They started five years ago in a major response to an issue that came up in Escanaba. Mm-hmm. Escanaba uh, County had an instructor up there that actually I trained as an NRA instructor, and he didn't follow every little thing that the NRA wants followed, and the NRA ended up revoking his credentials. The way that that all transpired was a county north of them had a training counselor that didn't like the competition because, quite frankly, the instructor was really good. Um, And he called the NRA and did one of those 
things that sometimes happens with NRA instructors in infighting, and they got the NRA to revoke his credentials so they wouldn't have as much competition, right? <laughs> yeah, I've heard of that. Happening. And then he went, yeah, he then he went to the gun board and said, "Hey, look, this guy's credentials got revoked, so therefore all the students that he ever trained, um, their training's no good, so their CPL licenses should be revoked." He was looking to get fifteen hundred people's licenses revoked. So then he'd have to retrain 1,500 people. Now, he retrained the seven people in his county for free, but he wasn't going to do that for the 1,500 people. Yeah, that's right. And that caused me – He the instructor called me and said, hey, you're a training counselor. What can I do about this situation? And once again, this is one of those situations where Bill Schutte as attorney general stepped up. I ended up going, hey, I'll call the NRA. I called the NRA. They said, look, we're not getting involved in it directly. I said, well, is there a problem if I, as a training counselor, go up there and talk to the board and tell them I'm not representing the NRA, but explain the law and explain why the training for these 1,500 people is fine mm -hmm. and that their CPL licenses can stay in place? Because basically what the prosecutor, the chairman of the gun board at the time, needed was political cover in front of the news media. Oh, okay. So I drove 10 hours in a snowstorm. I mean, I was going like 25 miles an hour that November, mm -hmm. and I went up there, and on my way up there, I called the attorney general. I called Bill, and I said, hey, Bill, I said, here's what I'm doing. Here's what's going on. He said, oh, I know the prosecutor over there. Don't worry about it. He'll do the right thing. I said, what if he doesn't do the right thing? What happens <laughs> if he makes the wrong decision? And Bill said, well, then you call me in. An hour later, I make sure it all comes out right. I said, well, that's fantastic, Bill. That's an ace in the hole. Yeah. It's nice to know that when you go into a fight, you've already won. <laughs> For sure. So Bill Schutte stood up. It was fantastic. I went up there, did what I needed to do. And from there, they recognized that even there, there were some things that they needed to make sure that they had a good, solid organization at a local level. And the Delta County Gun Owners Association kind of formed at that point and really took root. And they did a banquet this year kind of like a Ducks Unlimited banquet and, you know, Pheasants Forever and Wild Turkey Federation-style banquet. Um, in fact, they had uh, Tom Lambert, the president of Michigan Open Carry, up there speaking this year, and I went up there and attended this year. And they raised $17,000 in one night. Wow. From the UP? That's incredible. From the UP. Wow. They had a crowd of three or 400 people there. That is awesome. You know, are, do they do this every year? They're doing it every year. You and know, it's getting bigger and bigger every year. Oh, gosh. Well, hey. And I'm they, telling you, every single county should follow their example and have a county gun owners association yeah. and hold their local elected officials to the fire. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, because that's where it all starts, right? You don't start out as mm -hmm. a governor. You, you start out as like a county commissioner or the school board or something like that, and you just work your way up. Hmm. Yep, and for the litigation stuff that the, the Michigan Open Carry has currently been doing, like the school case that just went before the Supreme Court, Delta County owner, Gun Owners is probably one of the single biggest donors to Michigan Open Carry, and yesterday on the Capitol steps they presented a check for $1,000 to MOC for the legal fund. Oh, wow, that is awesome. Well, I have got to get to know these people. Who, who Who's the, the leader of, of Delta County Gun Owners? Bill Hawley is currently the leader up there. Um, and I'm sure you can get a hold of him through their Facebook page and get a hold of Bill. He'd be a, a solid guy to have on the self defense, the home defense show. Oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds great. You should do an interview with him about how that formed and how somebody that is passionate about that might get involved and maybe mm -hmm. form one in Barry County. And maybe we need to expand and do better here in Calhoun County. We've got a local gun owner association here in Calhoun County, but we could probably do a lot more with somebody that maybe has some energy. That's awesome. Uh, now, thank you very much for that that story, uh, uh, Joel, because I really didn't know that. You know, you know that's the nice thing about networking. You know, you and I get together. We get together with other other gun owners and advocates, and we just share the knowledge. Um, and yes. that's that's great. The smarter we are, the better informed we are, the more potent we are. So I'm going to call Bill Hawley. I'll, I'll get him on the show because he sounds like my kind of people. Um, he that's is great. And next year. Maybe you and I can ride together on up to uh, their annual uh, fundraiser. That'd be fantastic. I'll let you know because it's a very strong possibility that I might be their keynote speaker next year. Oh, well, you definitely. So I would love to take you up there with me. Know how to talk. <laughs> you did a great job emceeing yesterday, Joel. You really, really did. Uh, when we were doing the, the post-game analysis, um, you know, with Terry and, and Brian and Nate, 
one of the comments that we got over and over again from the attendees was that you have a lot of energy uh, and you fired people up, you inspired people. You just did a fantastic job uh, on that uh, yesterday. And uh, how many uh, times have you emceed uh, this event? This is my third year that you guys have invited me to do that, and I feel privileged every time you guys ask me to do it. And for as long as you ask me, I'm happy to do it. It's it's a great privilege and a great honor to be able to do that. Um, I enjoy doing it. it. It's a lot of fun to be there with like-minded individuals and having, especially this year, where we just had a huge crowd. We had the largest crowd that has shown up on the Capitol lawn for any issue yet this year. Yeah. Um, my conservative estimate was 1,200 plus, and if I were to go, what I really thought, I think we were pushing by 14 to 1,500 there. Oh, yesterday. that's that's awesome. That is awesome. Um, you know, why do you think so many people came this year? Because this year we did it different. We did it in the summertime as opposed to you know April. Do you think that's the main contributor or or not? Well, I think there's a couple of factors. One, uh, definitely you can get your summer soldiers and your sunshine patriots out there when it's a little warmer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 20-degree <laughs> weather in March, the only <laughs> ones you're getting there are diehards. Right. Like you and me. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we were concealed carry then whether we wanted to or not. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was cold, we had heavy coats on. But I, I think you pick up some of those people, and I certainly think yesterday, uh, having a concert there, we had Madison Rising there, and they did a phenomenal job mm-hmm. with a concert and entertaining us for, uh, for the hour there. I also think having a food vendor there was great. Um, it wouldn't hurt to have a couple more because that line was really long, and they were nonstop the entire day, they said. Yeah. So maybe another food vendor wouldn't have hurt. Um, for next year, so some of the the post game analysis there, but they did really really well, and having the food available there and something to drink and that sort of thing certainly helped with the crowd as well. Well, one thing that we always kick around every single year is a Wednesday, the way we've always done it, juxtaposed to a Saturday. Um, you know, but everyone always says, you know, you'll get more people on a Saturday. And then the counter argument to that is, yeah, but the legislature isn't in session. Lansing is dead on the weekend. What's your opinion on it? Would we get more or or less people if we held it on a Saturday? I think the real question is, is if a tree falls in the forest and there's no way there to hear it, does it make a sound? (laughs) Okay. Elaborate on that. (laughs) Well, the fact of the matter is, how much media coverage did we really get yesterday? We got some. M Live said there was hundreds. Okay, they didn't go in excess of a thousand. So we already know that we're not going to get the adequate or the right. accurate coverage from the drive-by media. And we also know that our entire purpose of being there is to. I mean, we can talk to ourselves all we want to. It's like preaching to the choir. Mm-hmm. What we're really there is so that legislators look out those windows and see the crowd size. Okay, so you vote That's for... That's what really matters. You vote for Wednesday. Absolutely. Okay. Because otherwise, we're a tree falling in the forest that makes no sound because nobody's there to hear it. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that I asked uh, Terry Stock to do uh, this morning was uh, put a uh, survey up uh, on our Facebook page and our website and give people options. You know, what do you want for next year? And that's one of the things. Do you want a Saturday? Do you want a Wednesday? Did you like the summer venue? Would you go rather go back to the spring? So uh, we'll be sharing those numbers uh, with you and, and everyone else uh, for next year. Because, we, hey, you know, we were big this year, and it was fun, and it was a great time. But we want it to be even bigger next year and just keep growing and growing and growing. So... Boy. It would be nice that once those fences are down and they've redone all the construction up there, that even with all those fences down, we still cover the entire white or the entire capital lawn. Yes, blanket that lawn. That would be fantastic, and that's our goal for next year. Well, Joel, any final words before we let you go? Yeah, I, I got to put a shameless plug in. There was one other major candidate for statewide office there. If there's any delegates listening, this is the name you need to remember because you're going to select this candidate, not in a primary vote among voters, but actually at your convention. And that's our statewide elected office for attorney general. And the name you need to remember is Tom Leonard. He's currently the Speaker of the House, and he's the guy you want as attorney general. He is solid, pro-gun, conservative, Second Amendment. And we will have probably, I mean, look, Bill Schutte's great. And I think Tom Leonard's going to be even better. Oh, 
Well, that's definitely a good plug, because Bill has done a great job for us as Attorney General. He has, and I think Tom's going to do even better. All right, Tom Especially Leonard when you consider, for Attorney General. When you, consider, when you consider how many of those bureaucrats that are in the Attorney General's office that were still there from the Frank Kelly regime, because Frank Kelly was there for so long, a lot of those guys are going to be retiring, which means this next round of Attorney General is going to be hiring a lot of the bureaucrats, a lot of those lawyers that are going to be there for a long time in the AG's office. All right. You want a good guy shaping that. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much for all of your input, your analysis, and your expertise, Joel. Um, before you go, tell us real quickly about uh, Freedom Firearms and all things Joel Fulton. Oh, thanks. I always appreciate that. Yeah, we're right down here in Battle Creek at Freedom Firearms. We have the indoor pistol range. We have a gun shop, full service, and we have our classes. Obviously, I do the classes just like you do. I try and stay out of Berry County. You've always respected me and stayed out of Calhoun County on the whole. But we take care of Calhoun County, and we've got a lot that come from Kalamazoo and the counties below us in Branch and Hillsdale. We love having all those folks come up here and, and do their training here. We use the same material you do. We use the United States Concealed Carry Association material, which quite frankly I think is some of the best material out there on the market for CPL training right now. Can't say enough good about them. Also, we have um, an advanced training class like you do. I know uh, my brother teaches that. In fact, we're headed up north to uh, Manistee area to do a uh, range safety officer class on Sunday along with an advanced training class. My brother and I are going to travel up there and do that. So we do a lot of things like that, and we really enjoy what we do just like you do because it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun um, just shooting and having fun with it and also knowing that that has a function if ever a worst-case scenario happens, I can take care of myself. I don't have to count on a government to do it for me. Absolutely. Joel, how do people get a, get a hold of you? Well, they can get a hold of us by telephone at 269-968-4CCW. That's 4229. That's 9684 CCW. And they can visit us on the web at freedomfirearms.biz, freedomfirearms.biz. And we also have an app out there. If you search for Freedom Firearms under your Android phone, we also have, um, you know, our online presence, Freedom Firearms dash online, and you can shop online with us. Um, firearms obviously get shipped here, but you can go right to our website and that'll link you there. Um, so lots of ways to get in contact with us. We're on Facebook. You can message us directly. I answer those things in the middle of the night when I wake up because, you know, I'm too old to sleep all the way through the night without having to get up and go to the bathroom anymore. <laughs> hey, I'm in that club. I understand what you're talking about, Joel. Joel, you have been fantastic today. Uh, thank you very, very much for being on the Home Defense Show. Hey, it's always a pleasure. Thanks, Skip. Okay, folks, we're going to take another two-minute break here. Uh, while we are away, go ahead and check out Freedom Firearms. Go on Facebook and just check them out. And then uh, check out our sponsors, firearmslegal.com slash Midwest Tactical and EliteFirearms.us. This is Skip Coriel on the Home Defense Show. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Welcome to my dad's Home Defense Radio Show. You're going to love it. Hey, folks. I want to tell you about my book, Civilian Combat, the Concealed Carry Book. More and more people across the country are seeing the dangers in society and are deciding to carry concealed to protect themselves and their families. My new book lays it out step by step. It'll teach you how to protect and defend the ones you love. Get the benefit of 17 years of teaching experience and a lifetime of training for this important role in society and in your family. You can get Civilian Combat real easy. Just go to Amazon.com, search on Skip Coriel, Civilian Combat, and it'll pop right up there. Don't put it off any longer. Get Civilian Combat, the concealed carry book by yours truly, Skip Coriel. This is Colonel Danny Gillum. I host Front Lines of Freedom, a weekly syndicated military talk radio show. One of my co-hosts is Skip Coriel, the host of this show. We cover things that impact military and veteran communities, and we do it from the veteran's perspective. The show is broadcast across the nation and is also available as a podcast on our website, FrontlinesOfFreedom.com. Please join Skip and me weekly on Frontlines of Freedom. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want you to have the very best handgun that money can buy. And that's why we recommend you visit Larry Jackson at Elite Firearms and Training. As a concealed carry instructor, I see people every week out on the range with guns they can't shoot properly because they didn't know what to buy. 
That will never happen at Elite Firearms and Training. Larry Jackson will personally fit you with your very own personal defense pistol. So call Larry Jackson today at 616-299-8715 or visit EliteFirearms.us. Skip, it's time for Armed America Report. What do you have? All of us here at Frontlines of Freedom want our listeners to get trained and get armed in that order. We fully support the right to keep and bear arms for all law-abiding families, and we encourage you to find out about the laws governing use of deadly force in your state and follow them to the letter. And of course, don't forget to follow the rules of safety and common sense whenever you're carrying a firearm to protect the ones you love. What's the story this week, Colonel? Well, when a Clearbrook, Virginia resident saw an intruder's hands reaching through his bedroom window, he fired his 12-gauge shotgun, killing the interloper. Deputies found the suspect dead in the yard after they responded to a 911 call when the homeowner reported the shooting. Okay, Skip, let's hear your analysis. Thanks, Colonel. 12-gauge shotguns, like the one used in this story, have long been the traditional go-to gun for home defense simply because of the massive knockdown power they possess. Let's face it, handguns are great when you're out and about and are limited to portable firearms, but shotguns are the most powerful firearms inside a home that most civilians can legally possess. There are a lot of advantages to a shotgun. Let's go over a few of them right now. Number one, raw power. At close distances inside your home, shotguns produce a high amount of kinetic energy, especially when delivered via nine double-lot buckshot pellets. Double-lot buck delivered via a 12-gauge shotgun can actually stop the forward momentum of an intruder. Most handguns aren't capable of delivering that strong a punch. Number two, wide range of ammo choices. Most people stick with buckshot, but you may not have to. You can go down in pellet size if you have small rooms in your house. I recommend you walk around your home and determine where you are most likely to have to take the shot should you encounter a home invader. Then pace off the distance. If you have small rooms and the longest shot you take will only be 10 or 12 feet, then feel free to use smaller pellets like maybe a number 4 or number 5 shot. The important thing to remember is that you must have enough energy to penetrate the rib cage and get into the vitals. Another great choice is specialized personal defense rounds for shotguns like the PDX Defender and the Hornady Critical Defense Rounds. Both of these products pack a huge punch and cause massive tissue damage and blood loss. One of the potential disadvantages of the 12-gauge shotgun is increased recoil. The recoil on a 12-gauge can hurt your shoulder or even knock a smaller person on their butt. If you want a visual on this, go to YouTube and do a search on Women Shooting Large Guns. Most women have smaller frames than men and less upper body strength, making it tougher for them to control the recoil on these powerful shotguns. This can be handled easily enough by simply dropping down to a 20-gauge shotgun instead of the 12. It won't matter to the criminal if you shoot him with a 12 or a 20, because in both cases, they'll be dead. The only difference is the amount of mess you make. Another disadvantage with shotguns is smaller ammo capacity. Most shotguns hold only 5 rounds. However, you can buy specialized tactical shotguns with extended tubes which boosts your ammo supply to seven rounds. There are also some widespread myths about shotguns that just aren't true. I expect they were perpetuated by Hollywood movies, but real life isn't anything like Hollywood, so let's dispel those myths right now. Number one, if I use a shotgun, I don't have to aim. Ask a pheasant hunter if he has to aim, and he'll tell you yes. He'll either be point shooting or using the sights and leading the target. Let me put this into military terms. A shotgun is not a Claymore mine you have to aim it. At a distance of 10 feet, the pattern spread using double-out buckshot will be less than the size of a baseball. It varies depending on the choke of your barrel. But people see movies where a man sticks the shotgun through the doorway, presses the trigger, and everyone in the room dies. And they believe it, but it's just not true. With a shotgun, it's one shot and one kill, just like with a rifle or a handgun. Number two, I won't even have to shoot the gun. All I have to do is rack the action and the sound will send the bad guys running. This isn't true either. There are very few documented accounts of bad guys running away because they heard the sound of a shotgun being racked. According to the study by Greg Alifritz, only 40% of criminals flee upon encountering the armed citizen. So, don't count on the bad guy fleeing. Be trained and prepared to use deadly force and you won't be disappointed. When I weigh the strengths and weaknesses of a shotgun, I believe it's a very fine choice for home protection. The advantage of increased knockdown power cannot be downplayed. I can sum it up by something my wife said to me. Honey, if I have to shoot somebody, I want to see body parts flying off. So, I'm not surprised that the home invader in this story was killed with only one shot. It's very hard to beat a round of double-out buckshot at close range. Home defense is where the shotgun shines. 
Thanks, Skip. Okay, folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. This is your host, Skip Coriel. Joel Fulton from Freedom Firearms. Awesome, awesome man and a good friend of mine and of the Second Amendment March. Joel, thank you again for emceeing our event. Uh, You made it a success. Also, thank you to Terry Stock, President of Second Amendment March, Brian Jeffs, Vice President of Second Amendment March, and Nathan Nephew, the Treasurer of Second Amendment March. You three folks, oh, you worked your butts off this year, and I really, really appreciate it. Also want to thank Michigan Open Carry and Michigan Gun Owners for helping us to sponsor uh, the march. Uh, Another one of our sponsors was uh, Firearms Legal Protection and Delta Gun Owners. Again, hey, you all did fantastic. This was a team effort, and it was, boy, probably the best march that we've ever had. If you missed it, boy, come next year because it's going to be even better. All right, we are running long today, so I apologize for that. Not really. But, hey, we just had a lot of good stuff to talk about and a lot of things to celebrate. But this is the part in the show where I always tell you what I really think. So here we go. You know, folks, I was out cutting firewood yesterday, and I was thinking about what I should talk about at the Second Amendment March. Hard manual labor always clears my head and helps me think. So I did a lot of work getting ready for the march. I even mowed my lawn. I got all hot and sweaty. My back was sore. But I was okay with that, simply because the work had to be done. But as if all that discomfort wasn't enough, then the mosquitoes came out. And if there's one thing I can't stand, it's mosquitoes. I mean, think about it. What good are they? They bite us. They spread diseases. They suck out all our blood and then give us nothing in return. They take and they take and they take. And all they give us back for our support is heartache and pain. And so then I got to thinking about politicians. It's a natural transition, I think, to go from mosquitoes to leeches to ticks to, well, those who would strip us of our freedom. Fortunately for us, we get to choose the people who make our laws and who govern us. And that's what makes America so special. But these days, politicians just aren't very popular with the common folk. But here's the reality of the situation. No matter whether you love politicians or hate them or just tolerate them, they're still there. And they'll always be the ones on the ballot. But this year, I think we have some pretty good choices, at least when it comes to the governor's race here in Michigan. And we heard from many of them at the Second Amendment March. But let's face it, folks. We've all known some pretty slimy politicians in our time. Sometimes we vote for someone and they seem like a good person, sincere, hardworking, principled, And they're saying all the right things, so we give them our vote. And then they go away to Lansing or Washington, D.C., and the next thing we know, the things they said they believed in don't seem to count for much anymore. The promises they made prior to the election never seem to get kept. And that really bothers me, and it makes me wonder, how the heck can we even know how to vote? I mean, for all we know, the political candidates could be lying through their teeth just to get the job, to get the power. And then when they're elected, they'll become infected with some strange strain of political Alzheimer's disease where they totally forget their promises. At the Second Amendment March, we had three guys speak to us who were running for governor, and all of them asked for our support. Listen, over the next couple of months before the primary, they're going to be asking again and again and again and again. They'll want your time. They'll want your money. But the problem is, how do you know Who are the politicians and who are the real patriots? And here are some guidelines for you to follow. Number one, by your fruits, you shall know them. Look at their track record when it comes to the right to keep and bear arms. Are they all talk and no action? Or have they actually done something significant to advance the Second Amendment? Fifty years ago, a person was judged by whether or not they kept their word. Folks, we shouldn't have stopped doing that. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Hold all elected officials accountable to their words. If they say they're going to do something and they don't, then let's elect someone who will. In short, a person who doesn't keep their word shouldn't get your vote. Number two, 
when they talk about the Second Amendment, are they specific or do they speak in vague generalities? A candidate who says, I support the Second Amendment, but then fails to elaborate what that means, can't be trusted. Ask him flat out, do you support getting rid of pistol registration? Ask him directly, will you sign a bill to repeal pistol-free zones? Demand him point blank, will you sign constitutional carry into law? Some politicians can be slippery little vermin, so be careful before you vote for them. I once asked a politician if he supported the right to keep and bear arms, and he told me in no uncertain terms that he most definitely supported the Second Amendment. But then I followed up with another question. Do you support the right of citizens to carry concealed? He told me no, and I was confused. How the heck can you say you support the Second Amendment if if you don't support citizens carrying guns for personal protection. And that's when he shared with me his personal interpretation of the Second Amendment. In his mind, the militia didn't include people like you and I. It only pertained to the National Guard. We had an argument after that, and he didn't get my support. Again, be very careful. Nailing down a moderate politician can be like grabbing onto a grease pig. Just when you think you've got them, they slip away, and all you're holding is bacon grease. Number three, do they consider you a citizen or a subject? This is a tough one, but very important, because running for office is like going through a job interview or dating someone with future hopes of marriage. Ladies, remember how sensitive your husband was before you agreed to marry him? He brought you flowers, took you on dates, stayed up until 2 a.m. talking to you on the phone, and maybe he even shared his feelings with you. You know, I've even heard of extreme cases where men have pretended to enjoy watching Pride and Prejudice with their girlfriend, but then after they get married, all they want to watch is Bruce Willis, Sylvester Stone, and John Wayne action movies. What in the world happened to them? Did they change? No. They were simply telling you what you wanted to hear in order to conquer you. Some politicians act all sweet and lovable until they get the job, and then they revert to their true selves. And ladies, before you get all self-righteous, Have any of you ever had this thought? Okay, so he's a little rough around the edges, but I see potential here. I'll just get a bridle on him, and I can always change him after I get the ring in his nose. Oops, I mean on his finger. Folks, it doesn't work that way. Once a person gets what they want, the tendency is to show their true character. But by then it's too late, because you've already wasted your vote on a slimy politician. Here's the big question you have to answer. Do they feel accountable to the voters? Do they see you as the boss, or do they see you as their subjects? If they see you as mere subjects, then they'll suck up to you once every four years just to get your vote. But if they view themselves as servants, then they'll listen to you and heed your advice. We don't need any more arrogant politicians. What we need are public servants who will actually tell us the truth, who will say what they mean and mean what they say. We need leaders who will follow through on their promises, even if it means the media or the far left will excoriate them, even if it means they will lose the next election. We need to hear the truth. So, listen very carefully to what all these politicians are telling you these days. Weigh them, test them, examine their words as well as their deeds. We have some good candidates this year, so pick someone who will advance our right to keep and bear arms, because I'm tired of electing people who make promises they don't intend to keep. I'm reminded of the following parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. What does this have to do with politics? Just this. If you listen to these candidates running for governor and find one of them you trust, then you should act like the man in the parable. Once you find an honest candidate, one who will serve the public, one who will fight to advance your freedom, one who will not be corrupted, then you have found a pearl of great price. And you should support that person with your time and your resources. And that, folks, is what I really think. All right, well... I'm afraid we are out of time, but we had a great Second Amendment march in 2018. Oh, all of you who are there will be speaking about it for another whole year, because 2019 Second Amendment march will be even bigger and even better. 
Keep looking at 2amarch.com, the number 2, the letter A, march.com, 2amarch.com. We're putting up a survey to ask you, what do you want for next year's March? How can we make it better? We want your input. We are out of time for today, but check out our sponsors, firearmslegal.com slash Midwest Tactical. Protect yourself from the criminal justice system and go to elitefirearms.us. Give Larry Jackson a call. Pick out the very best firearm for your family. Okay, folks, that about wraps it up for this week's episode of the Home Defense Show. Until next week, remember your purpose in life is to find something greater than yourself and serve it. Always remember, God, family, country, in that order. It's important how you live, and it's equally important how you die. Your family and the ones you love need your protection, so train, always train, stay alert, stay alive. Until next week on the Home Defense Show, this is your host, Skip Coriel. God bless you, God bless your family, and God bless America. Thank you for joining us this week on The Home Defense Show. Now, get out there and protect the ones you love. We'll see you next week with more of the best in home defense. Bye-bye, boys! Have fun storming the castle!